All right. So I believe, yes, we are now being recorded. So once again, I'll do one last introduction. Welcome everyone to um, Successful Scientists. This is the Earth and Environmental Science Room. So if that is not your major, um, please go back to the um, Wadloop Ready page on Teams and find the correct channel for you. And then, oh, Luke is here, <laughs> awesome. So welcome everyone. This is one of our advisors. And we're so happy to have you join us. Uh, we'll be starting with the advisor panel. So I was just saying, welcome everyone to Successful Scientists. Uh, this is a great event. We'll be able to speak to our advisors as well as a panel of your students, talk about your program, and make sure if you have any questions, keep them ready and put them in chat to be later answered for our upper year students. So as we're getting ready, I will just be sharing our PowerPoint for today. And once again, my name is Evan, nice to meet you. I'm in my 3B of Environmental Science Ecology, and this year I'm one of the Orientation Week uh, leader coordinators. So happy to be here and happy to meet all of you. So uh, Chloe, Phil, and Luke, are we able to see the um, PowerPoint? Yes. Yep. I don't, I don't know if this is the right Wait, one, Evan. I, I believe you are correct, sorry. Mm -hmm. One moment. Oh, sorry. Once again, now should the current one being shown? Is that staying successful scientists for everyone? Looks good, man. Yeah. All right, perfect. Sorry for the once again. Uh, we are very sincerely sorry for the technical difficulties today, but we are very grateful to have all of you here. So without further ado, if our advisors are ready uh, to kick off the event, I would gladly pass it over to them. Thanks, Evan. We're just um, uh, waiting on Jonathan Witt to, to join us as well, um, but we can uh, get started with some introductions. Um, so my name is Luke Balch. I'm an academic advisor um, for Earth and Environmental Sciences. Um, specifically all the programs and specializations um, besides ecology. Um, as you may know, the ecology program belongs um, to the biology department in which Jonathan Witt is the advisor there, and he'll introduce himself when he joins the call. Um, and we'll get into more in this presentation about what it is an academic advisor and what we do. Um, but I'm going to let uh, Jen Parks introduce herself right now. Hey guys, so uh, my name is Jen Parks and like Luke, I'm an academic advisor in um, uh, Earth and Environmental Sciences, but I'm also an instructor uh, in the department as well and that's actually my main job. Um, so all of you that are taking uh, Earth courses, especially once you get into 2A courses, um, you'll probably start seeing me around. I usually teach more of the rocky courses and more of the courses that uh, have to do with field school. So we'll get to hang out a lot in uh, 2A for sure. Did we find Jonathan yet? Uh, I just sent him the link, but um, when he joins us, we can we can jump in, so we can continue on, Evan. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Oh, oh, awesome. Okay. Go ahead, Jonathan. Welcome. You can introduce yourself. All right. Uh, my name is uh, Jonathan Witt, and I am the um, academic advisor for the um, ecology, um, the environmental science ecology specialization. Just as my camera working there. Yes, it is perfect. And so basically um, what we're going to do uh, today is we're going to give you an introduction to the university and an introduction to ourselves and basically get you familiar um, with the major aspects of the university and the way we function and things like that. Um, if you want to, um, have you all introduced yourselves, Luke, Jen? Perfect. OK, um, we can we can move ahead then and advance the slide. All right. And so basically we are academic advisors. And so we are people who are put on this planet specifically to help you guys. And so if you've got any kinds of questions about anything at all, even if you've forgotten what your own name is, come and see us, we'll be happy to help you out. 
And the kinds of things that we um, provide you with support with is questions that you might have about course selection. If you're thinking about what courses you need to select and what are the best terms to take them in, questions like that, we can certainly help you with that. We can help you with minors if you're interested, for example, in doing a minor in history or a minor in economics or something like that. We can connect you with the correct person in either the history or the economics department um, so that you can ask questions about the requirements of that minor and they can help you um, get enrolled in that minor. We can also help you with things concerning exchanges. Um, the University of Waterloo has exchange agreements with universities all over the world, and it may be that you may decide that, you know what, I would like to do a term and study in Spain, or I'd like to study in France, or maybe Korea or Japan. We have students go to all kinds of countries on exchange programs, and we can help you and find you um, information about that if you're interested in it. We can also provide you with assistance in resources on campus. And so, for example, if you are experiencing some personal difficulty, we can help get you connected with our counseling services. And we have a very, very good counseling service at the University of Waterloo who are here to help you and support you with any difficulties that you may encounter. We can also help you with career planning. Maybe you're thinking about doing a master's degree once you're finished your um, bachelor's degree. We can provide you with information about how to go about applying for different programs and help you think about your future in that way. And we can help you with all kinds of general inquiries that you might have as well. And so we are resource people and we are here to help you. And so please, if you've got any concerns, if you've got questions uh, about your program, if you're worried about your grades, if you've had um, a bad um, course in a particular semester, don't be afraid to come and talk to us about any of those um, kinds of things. Um, can we get the uh, next slide, Luke? All right, and so what I'm going to do now is tell you a little bit about the structure of the university itself. And so the University of Waterloo is a, a fairly big institution. We have approximately, I think, 36,000 undergraduate students uh, at the moment. And the university itself is divided into six different faculties. And so we have the faculty of engineering, we have the faculty of math and computer science, we have the faculty of applied health science, we have the faculty of arts, we have the faculty of the environment, and we have the faculty of science. And so all of you are enrolled in earth science or environmental science programs. And so you are all students within the faculty of science. And so the faculty of science is your home faculty. And within the faculty of science, we have four different departments and two different schools. And so within science, there is the Department of Chemistry, there is the Department of Physics, there is the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences, and there is the Department of Biology. We also have two schools, the School of Pharmacy and the School of Optometry. Those are our two uh, professional schools. And so if you are enrolled in the environmental science water science program, the environmental science geoscience program, or honors earth science programs and, or hydrogeology, any of those, you belong to the Department of Earth Sciences. 
If you are enrolled in the environmental science ecology specialization, you belong to the Department of Biology, actually. And so within each of the departments, there are a number of different kinds of people. You have professors, you have laboratory instructors, you have teaching assistants, and you have upper year students and graduate students and PhD students. And so you're all going to become fairly familiar with professors who are teaching um, your courses. They're going to be quite visible to you because they're on the front lines. And when you go into your laboratories, you're going to interact with laboratory instructors. And so these are people who are specifically involved in teaching laboratories. And so your professors um, not only teach you guys when you're taking courses, but most of your professors are actively involved in research as well. And so most of your professors are experts in their area of work, whether it be hydrogeology, hydrology, um, mineralogy or ecology and what have you, but they operate labs and conduct research. They also have masters and PhD level students who, who work in their laboratories. You're also going to interact with teaching assistants and teaching assistants are upper year undergraduate students or masters and PhD level students who are involved in teaching laboratory components of courses and also involved in providing support for lecture portions of courses. And so they will be involved in teaching you directly or answering questions and helping you out, often involved in marking term papers and examinations and things like that as well. And you're also going to interact with upper year students. You're going to meet some of them today and they are a really, really good source of information. It's a really good idea if you want to think about um, what's going to be happening in the future or what's a really good elective course to take. Don't be afraid to ask an upper year student because they've got lots of experience and can help provide you with information as well. And so um, I think that's all that I want to say for the moment. And so I think at the moment I will now turn things over um, to Luke. One thing I do want to say um, before I do that is normally we would be having um, this meeting in a room on campus somewhere and we would be bringing some pizza in or some sandwiches and things like that. But unfortunately, a little something called C-19 has prevented us from doing that this year. But what we're really hoping is that we will all get back onto campus in due course. Obviously, we don't know um, exactly when that's going to be. And we'll be in a situation where we can all meet in person and get back to some semblance of normality. But for the moment, um, we're using an online format for this meeting and many others out of necessity. And so, uh, Luke, I will turn it back over uh, to you now. Thanks, Jonathan. And if, sorry, if I may, I just yeah. wanted to add in. Uh, uh, Jonathan Witt mentioned having questions for upper-year students, and that reminds me that after this, we'll be having our upper-year panel. And at the beginning, I did say that uh, first years can have questions in the chat. However, there appears to be a small technical difficulty, so please just hold on to those questions in your mind. And once we get to that section of the presentation, uh, we will just have you use the raised hand function on Teams, and then we can call upon you, and you can use your mic at that point. So I just want to have that clarification. Uh, Luke, of course, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Evan. Um, yeah, it's important to have questions. Um, you know, you never know who else has that same question and maybe is, is too uh, intimidated to ask. And so um, no questions, dumb question is lots of stuff what we're covering today. So um, Evan, you can just move to the next slide if you want. All right, so what should I know in first year? Um, so I'm gonna take a little bit of time here to go over um, some things you might've heard already, the you know difference between high school and university. Um, you know, as you can see from this slide here, um, we'll go over the the high school thoughts. Um, you know, 
the preparation for class uh, is a big one. Uh, as you probably, you just came from high school, you show up to class and, and you learn the material. Um, obviously, there's there was homework assigned, um, but there's really limited independent work that, that was necessary. And so you can see the bottom there, 80% um, of the learning was done in class by your teachers. Um, and their expectation was you did 20% of the independent learning and reading and assignments outside of class. And so for university, that's flipped on its head. And, and sometimes it's a shock for some students where uh, you go to class and, and there's just so much material for the instructors to cover that they only really get to cover about 20% of the stuff that they expect you to learn. Uh, and 80% of the is done on your own. And so, and what I mean by on your own is, is prep, first of all, preparation before class. And obviously this term is going to be a little bit different because you're not uh, walking to a physical classroom and, and in which you have to be prepared for. Um, but we do really suggest that you, you treat it the same. And so um, you you look over some of the lecture slides and, and you do some of the assigned readings before um, you press play on a lecture or you work through um, a lecture slides um, in your online formats. Um, the instructor focuses on teaching main concepts in class and this will be the same in a virtual classroom as well. Um, they're going to highlight some some main and key points that they really want to help you further understand. Um, again, though, the expectation would be that you're you're developing your knowledge outside of that um, that small lecture time that they have with you. Um, as well, many of the courses are going to have some lower stake assignments. Um, you know, some are even two percent, five percent, and what those are are. are are there for is to help you um, work through some of the problems and understand what the expectation is um, leading up to either bigger assignments, you know, maybe it's 15 to 20 percent assignments um, or even um, even exams um, where these same questions will be on exams. And so um, really what this slide is highlighting is is just understanding that difference and, and everybody will have uh, you know through the first couple of weeks and you'll find your own your own rhythm to it. Um, I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware that um, how important that is of, of doing preparation and taking the time outside of the traditional lecture where you're logging on now um, and viewing the instructor um, when that's over. It's not necessarily over. Um, it, you, you, you must be doing some work on your own so. Uh, you can go to the next slide. That's awesome. Thanks. So here's a, a few online tools um, for success. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of all these, but we'll go over them quickly. So learn um, is our, our go to site for all your courses and obviously this term all of your lectures. Uh, each course will have uh, um, be in learn on its own. And so that's where you you go on day one on September 8th and, and you download your course syllabus and you understand what um, what's the expectation for that course um, and make sure you get each of your courses and, and understanding um, you know what you need to do for those courses. That's all done through learn. Um, grades will be posted, assignments will be handed in. That's going to be your go to. So make it your make it your your bookmark or even your home page when you turn your browser on. Uh, Sci space group, uh, the second bullet under learn there. That's a, a group where we um, we post specific updates and by we I mean the science undergrad office, which we'll talk about later. Um, reminders and updates for all students. Um, sometimes they're first year students specific and what we want to do is, is make sure you don't miss any deadlines or make sure you don't miss any important things or important announcements. And so that group that you'll see on your learn, um, that's what that's there for and we'll, we'll post resources in there. And so um, keep an eye on that. Uh, next bullet point down is Quest. Um, you, you, everybody used Quest through the admission process, so you should be familiar with it now. But as you transition to a, a Waterloo student from a, from an, um, the admission side of things, you now um, can do course adds and drops. You can view your official grades. And of course, when we have schedules, eventually um, that's where your course schedule will be and the when and where of of your classes and you know we've received many students asking where my schedule is and, and as you know there is no traditional schedule right now for first year students um, because everything is virtual and done on your own and happy to ask, uh, answer any questions about that later on um, email you might be getting this uh, um, the same message five six seven eight twenty five times but it is important that you check your emails and has to be your at uwaterloo.ca email address. Um, you know, if I could say one thing, it would just be please read them all. Um, you know what? They might not all be super relevant for you, but you know, the ones that are relevant are, are pretty important. Um, 
and so that's going to really help dictate and, and help you work through it and not miss important things is reading those emails. And the final one is, is tips for online learning. That's a, a great uh, URL that um, our student success office has, has uh, put a resource in for, um, you know, if, if you're struggling or trying to wrap your head around, how am I going to do this five courses online situation? That's where all of the information is, all of the research for how to be successful um, doing online courses. And so I would uh, I would suggest you give that a quick read um, prior to the start of classes to help you get organized and situated. OK, so quickly um, program expectations. Um, so what are your grade expectations? We get that question a lot. And so uh, the first point there is you know, each course um, has a course syllabus. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, and that's going to determine your assignments, your quizzes, your tests, your exams, and, and what's each part worth. And, and why is that important? Well, if something is worth 2%, we don't want you spending 15 hours on it. Um, you know, the, those those small two to three five percent, those add up and those are important to do, but that will help you get your, your mind around understanding how much time you need to put into certain things. Um, and obviously the due dates are on there and you want to get those into your calendar um, that first day. And so you, you don't miss anything. Um, but really for, for academic advising and what we want to stress is, is 60% overall average. So that's all of your courses combined. You need to have a cumulative average of 60% as well as a second average is 60% in your science courses if you're an ecology student or 60% in all of your earth labeled courses if you're not an ecology student and you're in the earth sciences and that's to stay in your program and so if if either of those independently drop below the 60% threshold um, you're at risk of, of being removed from earth science and put into a, a general program or worst case scenario, um, having to, to sit out some time because of some academic penalties that you'll be that you'll have. Uh, I don't anticipate anybody getting there. Um, very, very few first year students do. Um, but if you feel like you might be getting to that that scenario, you really need to reach out um, to myself or Jen or Jonathan to have a, a conversation about that. Um, what courses should I take? Well, course selection is uh, September 24th to October 6th for the winter. That's tentatively right now. We're still figuring that out. But the good news is uh, everybody in this conversation here has no electives. Therefore, all of your courses will be chosen for you from the science undergrad office. And so we're going to do the work for you. <clears throat> I really do want to highlight that going into second year, we stop doing this. I always get uh, 15 to 20 students say, hey, where are my courses going into second year? And I uh, have to always say that that's your job now, not mine. Um, so, but we will put you in your required courses, not a big deal. So don't worry about that. And uh, these are just these three links that I want to highlight um, the undergrad calendar. And so, um, you know, these are hyperlinks, but you could always Google these, no problem. Undergrad calendar will walk you through your program. What courses you need to take in what terms in order to get your degree. This will be your, your kind of your lifeline or your, uh, it's actual a contract between student and university that if you may, if you get these courses in, you will become a graduate of the program that you're in. So that, uh, that is super important. Um, obviously all of the regulations and everything lives there. Schedule of classes, that's that's just what courses are offered in, 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 what, in the term that we're in and if there is any space and important dates, um, that's a registrar's office website where everything's listed there from fees to dropping courses to adding courses to everything. So you can pop some of those important dates in your, in your own personal calendar if you don't want to miss them. And uh, I think that's uh, all for me. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss it over to uh, Jen Parks. All right, thanks Luke. Uh, so this is just something that we want to put on everyone's radar uh, right away in first year. Uh, although, as Luke has just mentioned, you guys really don't get to pick uh, many courses uh, in your first year. So this is something that will become a little bit more important uh, when you go into your uh, second year courses. Uh, but generally, once you guys are done your undergrad degrees, and if you're out there practicing as environmental scientists or earth scientists, um, you need to become part of something uh, that is called the Professional Geoscientist of Ontario. So this is a qualification that you get after your undergrad degree. Uh, and essentially, um, there's a, a 
a board for Ontario, but every province or territory in Canada also has a similar uh, sort of professional registration program. Uh, and generally, if you want to be a practicing geoscientist, then this is something uh, that you'll have to uh, get. And it's very similar to the professional registration that engineers uh, go through. Uh, so if you um, are a geologist and maybe at some point in your life you might be estimating the amount of gold that is in a mine, um, you need to be a professional geoscientist in order to make that estimation and to sort of like stamp that to make sure you're making ethical um, decisions. Um, or if you're sort of more in the environmental science side, if you have to submit reports to the Ministry of Environment because the job that you have um, maybe let's say there's some wastewater and you need to make sure that you're um, disposing of that wastewater properly. That's also something that you need to be a professional geoscientist in order to uh, to sort of um, do that kind of work. And then once you get this qualification, you're called a PGO. Uh, so there are three things you need to do to be a PGO. Um, you have to um, do a certain amount of work experience, which is something you do once you're, you're done your undergrad degree. Uh, you have to write an ethics exam, which is something that you do once you're outside of uh, our University of Waterloo program. But the thing you need to make sure that you get while you're in our program uh, is that there's certain knowledge requirements you need to take in order to get this professional designation. So essentially, you need to make sure that you're getting the right course contents in your undergrad degree um, to qualify for this PGO. So this is why we sort of uh, bring this up in first year, um, just to kind of put it on your radar. Uh, and all of our earth programs will automatically qualify you for this designation. But if you are in the environmental science uh, programs, you do need to be careful about how you pick your electives in order to make sure that you get your course requirements for uh, to become a PGO. Uh, so in the environmental science geoscience program, there's just sort of one or two courses you need to make sure um, you pick properly. If you're in the ecology option, then you need to be even uh, a little bit more careful about how you uh, pick your requirements. And I believe if you're in the water science program, um, it's not a program that will get you this PGO qualification easily, and you might have to actually do an additional term uh, to be a PGO. Uh, uh, so this is stuff you can kind of put in the back of your brain. And we always do info sessions with the professional geoscientists of Ontario folks in the fall. So you guys will get an email uh, about this. Um, just something to think about and kind of keep on your radar uh, for uh, the future. And if you guys have any questions about it um, today or in the future, please send me an email to me and I'd be more than happy to, to talk about it. So you can go to the next slide. All right, so more fun stuff uh, to think about rather than being a professional geologist is um, in Earth and Environmental Sciences, our sort of natural laboratory is the outside world. Uh, so one cool thing we get to do uh, in all of um, the programs, no matter what specific program you're in, is we do a lot of field trips and we have a lot of field courses. Uh, so we collect all of our data from the outside world and uh, you need to actually go outside and get that data. So lots of field trips. So uh, when you take the intro to hydrology course, uh, Earth 223, that whole course is based on doing um, field activities every week. Uh, but then we also sometimes actually go away on field trips. Um, for the second year mineralogy course, we go to Bancroft uh, and you guys uh, will do a project on that. Uh, and then there's an Earth 390 course, which is a 10 day uh, field trip where we go up uh, around the Sudbury area and um, take um, and take a lot of samples and learn a lot about rocks. So uh, field trips is something that's really integral to our program and it's something that you know is quite often helps us to learn a lot about rocks or uh, the environment but also build community and uh, usually uh, they're pretty fun so keep your eyes open for those uh, in your second year uh, and uh, usually um, uh, there are tons of fun. You'll learn a lot. And then there's also some biology uh, field trips, which I'll let uh, Jonathan uh, talk about. Okay, perfect. Do you want to get the uh, next slide there? All right. Um, I just want to say a little bit about the biology field courses. And this is um, specific to students who are enrolled uh, in the environmental science ecology specialization. And so the Department of Biology is actually a member of the Ontario um, Biology Field Course 
uh, consortium. And what that means is we offer field courses and the field courses are all two weeks long and they take place at locations off campus. And also the other universities in the consortium offer field courses. And so every year there are approximately 35 different field courses that are offered and students in the environmental science ecology program or any student who meets the, the prerequisites can take field courses offered by the, de the uh, Department of Biology at Waterloo or courses offered by any other university that is a member of the consortium. And again, there's 13 different universities and approximately 35 different courses offered each year. And so there's a variety of different courses. We in biology offer a tropical biology course either in Costa Rica or Belize. Um, there is a special course on uh, reptiles and amphibians offered at the Queen's University um, Biological Station. There's courses offered in um, alpine ecology in the, <clears throat> excuse me, Adirondack Mountains of the United States, all over the place. And so when you get to fourth year, just bear in mind that that opportunity is there for you and you can use a field course as one of your program um, electives. And so I just want you to make you aware of that. They're really great opportunities um, to get out and do some field work and learn about um, an aspect of ecology that's really interesting to you. And um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that for now. Awesome, thanks Jonathan. Uh, so I'm not going to say too much about this because uh, I'm sure this might come up in the student forum afterwards, but the um, sort of the student group for the Earth and Environmental Science students is something called uh, Watt Rocks. Uh, so they've got a room in EIT 1017 um, and you guys can access that room uh, whenever you like when we're allowed to be on campus that is and it's sort of a you know a space um, to maybe uh, get together with your peers do a little uh, bit of homework um, and uh, you know just generally kind of get in touch with the, the undergrad community uh, in earth and environmental sciences also tons of really great stuff that they do go hiking and camping usually um, so BOT and EOT means beginning of term and end of term socials, uh, you know, sometimes um, get together with a couple of the profs and hang out with the students and, um, you know, just a, a good way to build uh, community within our departments. And there's lots of, uh, you can follow them on Twitter, uh, Facebook or Instagram. And that's all I'll say about that because I'm sure the students will have a little bit more to add about that, um, maybe in the, the student form. So you can go to the next slide if you wouldn't mind. Uh, another really cool thing about our department is that we have a really awesome Earth Science Museum. Uh, it's pretty uh, stellar. Um, we've got a great uh, rock garden. And once again, once we all get back on campus, these are things that you can kind of walk around the EIT building uh, and enjoy. But this also gives a really good opportunity for you guys to, um, you know, become part of the community by helping out with the, the museum. And this is sort of a little bit of a, a plug from Karina, who's the, the curator. Um, you know, uh, they're always looking for volunteers. They do a ton of outreach. There's also something called science outreach, um, which I'm sure you guys will hear about at some point uh, this week. Um, but they're always looking for volunteers. Um, it's a great resume builder, but it's also just a good thing to be part of our community and to spread the word about earth and environmental sciences. Uh, the museum is also, um, you know, hiring co-op students every term. And also, uh, you know, there's tons of resources that you can access if you're, let's say, when you're taking mineralogy in second year. Well, if you want to learn about minerals, a good place to do that is to hang out uh, in the museum. So just a shameless plug for our museum, which is super fun. And just to, so I mentioned that, you know, maybe volunteering is a good um, resume builder. Um, so just a couple of last points before I uh, hand it back over to Luke. So you guys are all in, in first year and uh, I imagine a lot of you guys are actually in our, our co-op program. Uh, but whether you're in co-op or not, um, one thing you might want to think about is like, you know, how can you improve your chances of getting a job during either your work terms or your summers? So especially because we are a program um, that is based a lot around doing uh, field work, um, 
one good thing to consider doing is to get your driver's license, particularly if, uh, you know, if you're in our co-op program, you don't start your co-op uh, term until after your second A. So maybe in the summer after your first year of university, if you've got the opportunity working on your license uh, would be a, a great thing uh, to do. And also, um, just getting any kind of job in the, that first summer is a really important thing to do. I know a lot of students are tempted sometimes to maybe stick around or take a couple of extra courses so they can kind of advance a little bit in their academic career, but it's actually really hard to get, you know, hired if you've never had a job in your life, which sometimes, you know, in high school, you might have spent so much time focusing on your academics that maybe you didn't have a job, but it is really important to have a job. Employers are looking for that on your co-op resumes or your uh, just your normal resumes, uh, they want to know that you can kind of show up on time and, you know, work in a team and things like that. So uh, I strongly suggest you try to get a job, even if it's, you know, working at Starbucks or what have you, you'll make a little bit of cash. Um, but then it also shows that you can, you know, be a good employee. And also, as I already mentioned, you know, volunteering with the museum or science outreach are also good ways to sort of add things to your uh, to your resume for when you apply for those co-op jobs. So once again, you know, that's probably going to be something if you're in co-op, it's not till after 2A, but these are all little things just to kind of keep in the back of your mind, maybe some ways to spend your summer before your 2A uh, term. And I think that's all I'm going to blob about. So uh, over to you, Luke. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate that. Um, okay, last few slides before we're going to toss it over to the, to the students. Um, uh, just about a support and resources. Um, you know, Jonathan did a great job at the beginning um, talking about instructors, TAs, and, you know, I talked a little bit about learn, so this is just rehashing, but um, if you're in need of some help and it's course specific, meaning uh, you're having troubles with some concepts in a course or, or understanding some material, um, you know, sometimes people reach out to advisors and we can't do much about that because we're not teaching the course and Jonathan and Jen both teach courses. So obviously if it's their course, yeah, you could definitely reach out to them. Um, but for first year, um, we recommend reach out to the teaching assistants as Jonathan already highlighted. Um, that's going to be your, your first step, um, obviously instructor as well. But if the instructor is teaching uh, a class of a thousand, um, you know, it's hard for them to get back to you right away. And so that's where the TAs come in handy. So just wanted to make sure everybody's aware of that. Um, if it is a, a specific question about something going on in a course, um, that's who you'd reach out to. If you're struggling in the course itself and want to potentially drop the course, that is when you'd reach out to an advisor. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. That, that would be great. And so uh, Jonathan talked about academic advisors. And so how the science uh, faculty works is in first year, your academic advisor is works in the science undergraduate office. And then in second year, you have a specific advisor in your program. And so that's where Jonathan Witt would take the ecology students. Uh, fortunate for everybody on this call is that uh, I have a dual role and I work as a first year advisor in the science undergrad office, as well as a program advisor in earth and environmental science. Uh, so what that means is you can just reach out to me starting now all the way through until you graduate. Um, so we don't need to go too much in depth on on this slide because what you're really going to do is uh, just utilize me as a resource in your first year. I uh, just wanted to highlight that in case you know so some of your friends are, are talking to their advisors. Um, it, all, it all runs through the, the science undergrad office, so I'll be talking to students in physics and in biology, um, all the first year students that need help, um, but it just makes it easier if you reach out to me um, because obviously I know the program very well and we can help you out. Um, the biggest thing people reach out to us for is, is like I said, struggling in courses, and, and this is going to be a unique term because we're not sure how it's going to go, being everything online. But if you are feeling overwhelmed, um, that's when we have a conversation. And, and what we talk about is maybe some techniques to get you back on track, or maybe it is dropping a course or even two courses to make sure you're not failing anything and you can make, make those grades that we talked about. And if you do have to drop a course or two, that's okay. You know what? What we're going to do is put a plan together to to get you back uh, on track and, and see how many courses in the winter and then maybe we take a course in the spring. You know, there's so many different scenarios that we can do. My my um, suggestion to you is just please uh, send us an email or send me an email and we can set up a chat just like this, obviously one on one um, and we could talk about it uh, and and let's do that before we get to the point where we're potentially failing or doing poorly in the course. So um, not too much on, on this front, so you can you can move past this slide. Uh, but these are some some interesting um, 
who can, who you can ask for help as well. Um, so we talked about student success office and, and you know running peer success coaching, um, the writing center. Um, those are some things that uh, if you're having trouble with some writing, reach out to the writing center. Um, if you see the wellness, you know counseling, health, athletics, mates. I don't expect you to remember all those. I just want to make make you aware that they are there. But let's let's have you work through advisors like myself um, to get you connected with those. So it's easier just got to remember one person myself, opposed to remember all of these names and, and having to to look them up. And and I want you to know they are there. Counseling is there. Health is there. They are on campus. So if you're on campus, you can actually go there if needed. Um, I believe they're going to be taking um, actual face to face if if needed. But they all of them have virtual appointments set up. We've been we've been doing this for a full term now. So and then on on the uh, the right side of the slide you can see uh, the social clubs and that's where what rocks would go in um, you know there's tons of other clubs available um, you know they they'll be emailing students and talking about what some of the things they're going to be doing um, from a remote standpoint but obviously it's going to be more impactful once you, once we get on campus and you can actually visit and, and interact with people so uh, again not a lot of time on this because um, you know this group is I don't want to say lucky, but you don't have to remember two different advisors. You can just come through me for first year students and then once you get to second year, it's myself, Jenna and, and Jonathan for the ecology. So um, yeah, we can push past that. And so uh, I don't know if we want to pause and, and take any questions um, for academic advising or anything related to um, your courses or anything like that. Evan, do you think we should take some questions now or do you want to push through the student panel? Uh, sure, so we can, that actually sounds like a great idea. So first of all, I'd like to thank our advisors, of course, for that amazing presentation and for their time here today. Uh, that was so much amazing information. So I also now invite our uh, student panelists to turn back their cameras and mics. And uh, yeah, so if you have questions, we have the raise hands function on your bar if you hover over your screen on Teams, and then I can call upon whoever has a question. So. Once again, uh, we are running a little bit uh, behind schedule, so we will not be ending at our estimated original time. So sorry if we are extending past your expected schedule, but we will be still having the same amount of Q&A time portion as last time or as expected. So we have a 20 minute question answered period. You can ask anything. We have both our advisors and our up year students here available to answer your questions that you have. So yeah, uh, we can start with maybe more of the academic ones for our, our advisors, but if you, really, if you have any questions, we are open to them all. All right, I see we have one from uh, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer, if you'd like, you can turn on your mic and ask your question. Um, hi, um, I was just wondering if I chose a specialization when I applied to the program, do I have to worry about changing it now? Because I kind of changed my mind. I applied with the water science specialization and then I decided recently I wanted to do ecology. And then I also got an earth science entrance scholarship. So that affects the, the award, even though you don't have to choose a specialization until after first year. <laughs> Uh, that's a great question, Jennifer. Um, lots of um, not as straightforward um, because of the entrance scholarship. Um, so let's potentially bring that one uh, maybe to a one on one. If you want to send me an email um, or, or I can reach out to you as well um, and we can talk about it because of the scholarship aspect. But to answer it more generally for everybody, um, ecology, water science and geoscience, those are all of the specializations within environmental science. The first year is all the exact same. And so you don't have to make any changes. Um, you can feel it out. Um, yes, you'll be a part of one group and not the other, but you can just kind of see what you like. And then it's really important to then make the change going into your um, your second year. So at the end of uh, uh, the winter, so April, um, you can you can make a change. And the change is super easy. Just submit what's called a plan modification form, um, and and we can do it that way. So my suggestion to you, Jennifer, would be to stay in the program you're in now. Uh, and then if you want to change to ecology after, um, we can talk about that uh, next term. OK, thank you. That makes sense. <laughs> thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank and you. then uh, I apologize, but something that might help with asking our panelists questions if, if we did the panelist introductions. So I will switch to that slide and we can have both of our up your panelists tell us a little bit about themselves so that that can maybe help prompt some questions that you might have for them. I can start. 
So hi everyone, my name is Chloe and my pronouns are she, her. I just finished my second year of environmental science with a specialization in ecology. So my to be term just finished this August and I was one of the students who took the very first fully online term. So if you have any questions about that, you can ask me uh, how that went. Uh, my school activities include a lot of science communication and outreach. So being an orientation leader, being a peer mentor, science ambassador. I have also been a part of Watt Rocks in my 2A term. So if you have questions about how to join that, some of the stuff uh, that I participated in, but as well, we also have our science showcase happening on Friday where uh, you can tune in to Watt Rocks's uh, presentation and uh, learn a little bit more about that. But in general, I would definitely recommend for first year, my advice to you would be reach out to your advisors and professors. I was a little shy sending emails, um, but when worrying over things like, oh, should we do this? What elective should I take? Worrying about it with friends. It's not worth it. Just send an email to your academic advisor or your professor and get that sorted out. They're there to help you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, Phil, uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself as well. Okay, I um, hope you guys can all see me. Uh, uh, my name is Phil, uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I am in earth science with a specialization in geology. Um, I'm in 4B and I've been like that for three terms, or I'm going to be in 4B for three or four terms. A lot of twists and turns along the way for my academic path. So if um, a lot of, yeah, if you have questions about that, just let me know. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, oh, awesome. Yeah, I, I volunteer with the museum. So if you have any questions about that, it's a lot of fun. Great experience. Thank you so much. So with that, once again, we are open to questions. Just use the raise hand function within Teams and we will get to them as soon as we can. So I believe we actually had one earlier in chat that we didn't have time to get to. So uh, Mike asks, what kind of co-op jobs are available to students in Earth and Environmental Science programs? So maybe if, uh, Phil, would you like to start talking about maybe your personal experiences? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Right. Um, what kind of co-op jobs are available to students in Earth environmental science programs? That is a good question. Um, so it kind of varies depending on your specialization and kind of what you're looking for. Um, and on Waterloo Works, you have a bunch of jobs. There are some camp jobs that get you some outdoor time. You get to uh, work with children, which is a lot of fun. Um, and then sometimes maybe you'll get a lab job or a job in a mine. Um, but it also comes down to your grades, any experience that you have. Uh, volunteering with the museum definitely helps a lot. You get some connections with Karina and she can always put in a good word for you. Um, and Jen is also a great resource. Um, I think it pretty much boils down to applying and connections that you make to get your foot in the door and then hopefully you get a, a great job that you enjoy. Thank you so much. And then I can also speak on my experience from the environmental science aspect. So I, as I stated before, I'm in the ecology specialization and I've had a total of three co-op job positions so far in my undergrad. My first two were both in municipal government positions, both in the environmental uh, services sector. So the first one I was working for the municipality of Markham, helping with their waterworks. So that was a lot of public outreach because I do really enjoy public speaking and helping uh, people out. And then my second co-op job was with uh, waste management here uh, actually in the Kitchener-Waterloo region. So both of those I was able to get hands on, learn sort of about infrastructure and programs that our cities provide to of course protect the environment and then really get that basic um, understanding of working in teams, time management that are all really vital in a job environment. And then my most recent job was actually um, for a research position. So I was over at a lab at Western University and I was helping them study 
algae growth and how that's affected by different levels of nutrients. So that was definitely a big shift, but it shows that there is a wide diverse range of co-op jobs available. And I really enjoyed it because it was really hands-on. I got to apply a lot of the things that I learned in lecture. So that's just a little bit from both programs. And as you can see, there's lots of great opportunities for all of our co-op students. And yeah, so thank you, Mike, for that question. Uh, does anyone else have any further questions? Uh, yes, we had one raised hand from, sorry. Oh, sorry, could you, uh, I believe Griffin? Yes, uh, thank you, Griffin. You can turn on your mic and ask your question. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, because what were like, what are the typical like grade cutoffs to get into the co-op, like most co-op ones? Because isn't it like a certain like you have to maintain a certain average like above the 60 percent to stay in the program like to stay into a co-op thing um yeah so that's a good question griffin um uh, like i said earlier uh 60 percent cumulative and 60 percent earth or science average is what you need to maintain in order to to keep in the co-op program if those drop below um then you would be removed from co-op and put into another program Oh, okay, thank you. Great, great question, Griffin. Uh, do we have any other questions about anything we've talked about from academics to even student life? Oh, uh, Selena, I ask you a question. Hi, um, as an environmental science student, I was wondering how feasible it is to like achieve a minor in terms of just like scheduling. I know there's a lot of courses um, that are like required to get uh, sp specialization. So how flexible is it in terms of getting a minor? Like, is that possible? Yeah, for sure. Um, which specialization are you pursuing? As of right now, I've decided on geoscience. OK, awesome. Um, and so there are definitely students in geoscience that pursue a minor. How it works is, is you can count a course um, for two different things. So you, if you take a course in geoscience, um, you can actually also count it towards a minor. So let's use the example of um, biology. You know, you have, um, you know, 1.75 units of biology in your program. And then if you wanted to pursue a biology minor, you can count those towards your minor. So now you need 5.0 units for a minor. Well, because you've already taken that as your core, um, you know, you don't need all pursue all five units. Um, geoscience, for example, does have um, 2.0 units of electives. It also has 2.5 units of program electives. And so there is space um, in each of the specializations. Um, you have to be very careful with it. And so my suggestion is um, you email me um, right from first year, if, if you if you really think you're interested in one, so then we can help plan. Um, first first year, there is no electives, but once you start having electives, you really got to use them carefully, and and you have to use them deliberately if you want to pursue a minor. And so the the earlier you can figure out what you want, you let me know, and then we can plan it out. And and sometimes, you know, let's say the course you need 41 courses or 42 courses to get your degree. Sometimes a minor you need 44, and so we had the conversation of, is, do you, would you like to take a couple more courses to get your minor, or would you try to find a minor that you can fit in your degree? Um, geography and environmental management is a popular one for, for some of our environmental science students. Um, biology is popular for geoscience. Um, if you're in ecology, you can actually get an earth minor, um, which is, is what a lot of the students get as well. So hope that answers your question. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'll definitely send you an email sometime soon. Great question. Thank you so much, Selena. So once again, if you have a question, just click the raise hand function. And Nicholas, uh, yeah, so turn on your mic and go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I have a question about like tests and assignments and such. Will there be like uh, a live like sort of thing that we have a certain date to date to be able to hand stuff that in? Like for like if the test would say it'd be like eight in the morning, we have to get on log on eight do it till 11 and then hand it in or how that work. Um, so did you want to take that look or do you want me to? Oh, yeah. Um, I have to take it. Yeah, you, I mean, you, Jonathan or Jen can do that. That's fine. OK, so often with um, with online learning, 
Um, typically, what will often happen is you might have a quiz or a test or a midterm um, that will be in an online format. And usually what will happen is there will be a window in which the quiz opens up. And so, for example, there might be a 24 hour period or a 48 hour period in which you need um, to complete the quiz or the or the midterm. In the case of assignments, um, there is in the learn platform, which I know you're probably not that familiar with yet. There is something called a Dropbox where you can put an assignment inside um, the Dropbox and hand it in. And normally most quizzes are done in learn. And so, for example, instructors can set up quizzes in learn and you answer them in learn. And once you start a quiz, you need to complete it in a certain amount of time. And so, for example, there is a window of 24 hours where when you can start the quiz, but once you've started it, you have to finish it in, let's say, a half an hour or 45 minutes or an hour or or whatever the case may be. Um, does that help answer that question? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. OK, anything else? Not Good for question. me, no. OK, perfect. Good question. All right, so if. Everyone can still use the uh, chat function, or sorry, raise hand function if you have any further questions. But we also have some frequently asked questions that we can provide to our panelists here. One is, how have you found school life balance in university? Bill and Chloe. Um, so I think this is a good question. I'm not really sure how it's going to go with online, um, but you, you kind of have to make time for yourself first. Academics is important, but so is your own mental health and physical health too. So take care of yourself and set aside some time to maybe take a walk around uh, the block, maybe say hi to your roommates, and then you'll be able to get down, like actually focus on work. So I found what worked for me is that I was able to go to the gym and then come back and then work in the lab and then actually get some like quizzes done, do my homework. Um, but you, you have to take care of yourself first too. And I think that's the most important thing. I definitely agree with having that balance. Um, in terms of my school life balance, in first year, I wasn't really a part of any extracurriculars. I was very, very shy to join things. Um, and I found that going into second year, I actually started joining um, clubs and different extracurriculars, volunteering. And I found that that actually helped with the balance, if that makes any sense, because now you have more of a schedule you have events to go to you have you know volunteering slots and that helps you create uh, more structure and also having that socialization and not just staying you know in your room studying all the time also helps with you know mental health and uh, make sure to maintain physical health as well during online classes um, try to take a walk you know safely with health regulations following those. Um, do some exercises at home. I found that I started actually working out. I do not work out, but I actually started during quarantine just because I had the time. So that's another way to balance. And just one last point, uh, because I did have a complete online term uh, this spring, I was a part of a lot of virtual extracurriculars as well. So peer mentorship, um, I went to club events. There was a woman in STEM coding workshop that I went to. So there will be a lot of virtual events that you can go to to um, keep up that social aspect of school life as well. Thank you so much. And so building on that, uh, would either of you like to talk about um, your involvement with clubs, such as Walt Rocks that was mentioned before earlier? Um, oh, Chloe, do you want to go? Sure. Uh, I probably have less to say about it um, because I wanted to join a club in second year. I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. 
I'm just gonna join. <laughs> um, and I really like uh, graphic design and um, I don't know, like Photoshop, Illustrator, things like that, photography. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna try to be a media person for a club. And I was like, what rocks, why not? Because that is, you know, Earth and Environmental Sciences Club. So I went there during their um, elections and I'd never been a part of um, any of the activities before, any of the events. So I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna apply for this executive position, not really confident in getting it, but I applied and I gave a little speech um, on the spot, uh, which is a little nerve wracking, but it's a story I really like telling because I had to stand up on a table in front of a bunch of upper years I'd never met before <laughs> and give a speech on the spot, but it was really fun. And somehow miraculously, I ended up getting the position along with somebody else that we were sort of like co-secretary media people. Um, and that's how I got involved with Water Rocks. I made posters about the term, helped organize with events. Um, we did rock climbing, we did pumpkin carving. I carved Water Rocks into a pumpkin. That was really fun. Um, so that's uh, my experience with joining our Earth and Environmental Sciences Club. Yeah, I think that's exactly how I started as well. It was my second year. Uh, I started, got up on the table, just started rambling on about random stuff. And I'm like, I like making posters, so I'll, I'll do it. Um, and I think uh, that I, I can't stress this enough, that please come by Warox as soon as we can. Uh, come and say hi. We love saying hi to people. Um, and in from my experience, um, first years don't normally say hi to Warox just because upper years can be kind of intimidating. We're not, we're super friendly. Um, and yeah, I've been involved with Warox, got up to prime minister, president, whatever we're calling it these days. Um, and then I just kind of you do what you do, you make events, we have bonfires, rock climbing, um, all sorts of social things like that. It's a lot of fun. Say hi, please. Thank you so much. So if any of our first year students are more interested about clubs such as Walt Rocks, we will be having an event called Science Showcase later this week on Friday, uh, starting at the same time as today's event. And so you'll be able to hear from Walt Rocks representatives as well as representatives from other clubs for example, the Biology Undergraduate Society, or BUGS, it can also be really applicable if you take more biology courses, such as those in the ecology stream. And so if no one has any other questions, I, we have one last frequently asked question for our panelists. So, uh, Phil and Chloe, what would you say is the favorite course you have taken so far in undergrad? Ooh, okay. Um... Sorry, Jen, it's not one of yours. Um, uh, I think the intro structural geology was a lot of fun. Um, we have a very well-known prof with structural geology. Um, we have Cheng Cheng teaching it and Shofu Lin teaching it. They're amazing. They're so helpful. Um, and I think in the lab with Cheng Cheng was honestly the best thing because you'll ask a question, he will get excited to teach you. Like he wants you to learn so much it's he's so nice he will not let you leave until you understand and i think i learned so much from his class in terms of my favorite course i'm gonna cheat a little bit and name two so first would be uh the first year earth course so earth 121 um i think it, I'm trying to remember if it's Introduction to Earth Sciences, um, something along those lines. So I really love the lab. I went into the ecology specialization thinking, okay, I really like plants and animals, really love nature, that's what I wanna do. But then I took the Earth course, learned a bunch about rocks, and uh, they're actually really interesting, surprisingly. Um, and I was like, okay, well, now I'm interested in Earth courses as well. Uh, thankfully, with the ecology specialization, there is um, mostly biology courses, but also a lot of earth courses. 
So I like just learning about how the earth um, comes to be, how you know mountains are formed, the different layers in the crust, um, things like that, and getting hands-on experience in the lab was really cool. So we literally had samples, looked at them, identified them, looked at their composition, their properties. Um, I found that to be really fun. And then second, I am going to mention a biology course. So I'm trying to remember the course code. It, mm, I don't remember it, but it was introductory zoology, I believe. Um, and again, with the lab, I just really like labs, um, hands-on things. So for my biology course, we actually went out into the stream on campus. So there's a stream that sort of runs through a certain area on campus and um, went in there, actually got some samples and looked at some little bugs under a microscope that we just took from there, um, identified them, uh, drew diagrams of them. I just liked seeing that connection between the lab, what we learned and actual field work. Thank you so much to both of you. So unless there's any last remaining questions, uh, we just have a few last slides I will be sharing. And then, oh, actually, I think Griffin, if you have a question, turn on your mic and go for it. Yeah, I just got a quick question. So um, for, because I know you have to take like the first year uh, physics uh, as like an introductory. I was just wondering like what kind of like physics that will be just because like I didn't really like, I didn't take grade 12 and I took like half a year grade 11 physics because I hated and struggled with it. So I was just wondering like what kind of like physics that will be. Uh, I can talk a little bit about that just because or, I did. Yeah, are, just, are any of our advisors uh, able to speak perhaps on that topic? I think I think Chloe, who's taken the course, can, can speak to it. Um, right. What I can speak to is, um, you know, it is a first year course, but if it's something that you're not comfortable with taking right in first year, we can push that course to another term um, because it, it's not a prerequisite um, in the environmental sciences um, streams. Um, if you're in an earth stream, then you need to take physics one and physics two. So it is important that we do get it, um, get it in quickly, but we can talk about that um, individually. But Chloe, if you want to mention some of the content, we can we can go over that for sure. So I also had to take that first year physics. Um, I am not a physics person in any way, shape or form. Uh, that's why I went into ecology because I only had to take one. So um, I did take it in high school, but I met a lot of people who didn't. Um, and they go over um, very general physics. Um, I would say things like, you know, Gravity, velocity, um, acceleration, <laughs> trying to remember exactly what we went over. But um, it's a first year course, keep that in mind. So it is catered to people who took it in high school and who didn't take it in high school. Um, I would recommend for sure for the course, uh, going, making sure you're attending all your tutorials and asking as many questions as possible. Um, tutorials are where uh, usually a professor or a teaching assistant will go over practice problems with you. So just seeing that process, seeing exactly what is needed to get full marks on tests and things like that, uh, super, super helpful. Um, again, reach out to the advisors if you are struggling a lot, but there are a lot of resources to help you um, succeed in that course, even if you haven't taken it in high school. OK, that doesn't sound too bad then. Thank you. Can I can I just uh, weigh in on here for a little second? And <laughs> um, it might be worth um, asking the question, if you're in environmental science, why do you really need to take a physics course in the first place? And so I think I'd like to address that. And when I finished um, my undergraduate degree um, back quite a long time ago now, um, I went into environmental consulting and the first job um, I actually had was with a company called Bar Environmental, which stands for Bar stands for Booth Aquatic Research Group. And my very first task when I went into that job was to determine if some 
salmon, salmon smolts, actually, the juvenile salmon, would be able to survive passing through a dam past a turbine into the river on the other side of the reservoir. And for that, what I had to do is understand how the pressure that the fish are exposed to is going to suddenly change as they pass underneath that dam. And what do you need to do for that? Well, in order to calculate the pressure, you need force equals mass times acceleration and all that stuff to calculate the pressure that a column of water that is so many meters deep is going to exert on that fish and what the change is going to be when it comes out the other end. And so the very, very first problem that I ever had to deal with was a physics problem. And so as it turns out, physics can be pretty important um, if you're in environmental science of any kind, even uh, ecology and biological science. There's one more thing um, I wanna say, um, and that is most of your professors um, have something called office hours. Now, at the moment, because we're on this online format as a result of the pandemic, um, they will be in a virtual format. But when we get back to campus, um, hopefully they will go back into a physical format when you can actually um, visit your professor during their office hours and answer any questions. And I really, really encourage you all um, to take advantage of professors' office hours. I teach um, a third and fourth year course and I have office hours every week. And one of the things that really disappoints me is how few students come and visit in my office hours. And so make sure um, you utilize those um, to ask any questions. And it's a really good way to get to know um, your professors. I get into all kinds of conversations with students about things that aren't even related to the course that are peripheral to it. And it's, you know, um, office hours are fun for me. It's a way for me to get to know my students. And it's a good way for you guys uh, and gals to get to know your profs uh, as well. And so I just wanted to say a little bit about that. All right, I'll shut up now. Thank you so much. That is definitely very vital information. Office hours are a great tip. So if we have no more questions. We just have a couple closing slides I will be sharing. And then, so if you do have further questions after today, please feel free to ask your leaders in your Wildly Ready groups, or even you can bring them to the event on Friday for Science Showcase. So uh, hopefully you can see the PowerPoint once again. So lastly, I just want to talk about some things that will be different. We briefly touched about uh, balance between school and your life. So you can just see just quickly in this table, the balance, uh, there's so many things to take care of on both sides, but you have to remember it's about balance to not prioritize one always above the other to make sure you have time for both. So academic tasks, such as of course your lectures, your assignments and projects and quizzes, but life tasks, whether that's self-care, whether that's physical, whether that's mental, eating, of course, and one of the biggest ones is sleep, because making sure that you get those right amount of hours of sleep can have a big impact on how you study and learn. And finally, here's some tips on how to thrive. Once again, self-care, we love to see it. Uh, please learn and practice healthy study habits early, so that could be taking notes, highlighting uh, videos such as that, Please also find balance between academic and personal development, plan ahead and manage your time wisely. So definitely, whether that's uh, sticky notes, whether that's a calendar or alarms in your phone, make sure you keep track of things such as deadlines and just your personal life events as well. Use online instructor TA office hours, as was mentioned earlier. And as always, don't be afraid to ask questions. Sooner is always better than later. So what is next for all of our first year students? Well, fall 2020 classes begin on Tuesday, September 8th. Please, before then, make sure you buy your materials. You can find out what you need, such as textbooks, by checking your U Waterloo book look online. And lab materials and other supplies, you can go to the W store. So for those things, uh, please always refer back to your course instructor, as they will specifically tell you what is needed for their course. For example, WIMIS is something that is needed before you enter labs, but 
for online labs, that will be determined by your lab instructor of what they require for those sort of health and safety requirements. Also, please make sure you check your Waterloo emails as that is one of the main sources that the university and instructors will be communicating with you throughout the term. And finally, this is looking a little bit more forward. You should you can think about how you want to uh, what courses you want to take for the winter 2021 term and then eventually when the selection opens, you can select those courses. So with that, that is the end of Successful Scientists. Thank you so much for everyone who is able to attend today. Uh, once again, we are sorry for any of the technical issues that may have occurred, but we really appreciate everyone being here. So with that, uh, thank you for your time. And yeah, uh, we will now be signing off, but it was a pleasure meeting all of you and hopefully we can see you at the Science Showcase event later. Bye everyone. Bye everyone, welcome to Waterloo. Welcome to Waterloo, I couldn't have said it better myself. Looking forward to meeting you.